Well, welcome to this, uh, this talk on money. In this talk and on the uh, uh, one that I'm delivering tomorrow on the theory of interest, <clears throat> we'll take up uh, the final two issues that uh, were hanging from uh, the discussion this morning on, on the theory of price. <clears throat> because you probably didn't notice this unless, again, you've gone through these arguments before and then you would, uh, you, you'd already be a trained economist and you'd, you would have noticed what I did in the uh, lecture this morning was I just sort of assumed that it's possible for people to rank um, goods against money. Now, in order to do that, uh, I'm presuming or assuming that there's a subjective value treatment that we can give to money. Uh, or to put it the, uh, uh, the way we did this morning, there's a demand and supply analysis that we can give to money. Because money enters into every uh, uh, preference ordering when we're buying things and selling things. So if we can't subjectively value money relative to the goods, well, then there wouldn't be any demand, right? Or, or there, there may be demand, but there's no explanation of demand that we could, uh, that we could give in this sense. So that, that's a pretty big uh, issue that we have to address. And that's what we'll do in this talk. And then uh, in the uh, talk uh, tomorrow on the theory of interest, we'll finish up talking about prices. Uh, Dr. Klein already talked some about producer goods prices. Uh, before a lunch, uh, we'll finish up by talking about the rate of interest, which, of course, is a crucial uh, regulator of intertemporal allocation. And so, so that will be the topic uh, of my talk tomorrow. <clears throat> okay, we'll take four steps in this uh, time together. We'll talk first about the nature of money. Uh, what, what is money? What's its function? How does it originate? How does it differ from other goods? How is it similar to other goods? This kind of analysis. Uh, then we'll, we'll uh, talk uh, then about the um, determination of the price of money. And then finally, uh, the, the last uh, comments I'll make are about the determination, the causes of uh, the production of money. <clears throat> and when we talk about the production of money, I mean, at least uh, initially, uh, I want to focus on the production of money within a market economy. What if we had a market economy? We had the entrepreneurial system of production for all goods, including money. What would that look like? What would the production of money look like? And then what's the production of money look like in our economy? So we'll, we'll end on that note. And that'll get us into the next uh, lecture of the afternoon on banking. OK, so let's start with uh, a topology of goods. Uh, and this will help us get at the uh, nature and, uh, and the function of money. <clears throat> so when we, when we um, divide up the different categories of goods. Uh, the two big divisions starting are present goods and future goods. And then, and this is not, by the way, not an exhaustive list, but it's sufficient for our purposes in this lecture. And then the present goods can be subdivided here into consumer goods. Consumer goods then can be used by a person in action to directly satisfy an end. And so that's why they're called present goods. We have a good in our hand. We have the, the, the uh, steak wrap in our hand, and we just act with it. We just eat it, and the, and the uh, end is attained. <clears throat> uh, 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 then, then the second category is media of exchange. Media of exchange uh, are used to facilitate exchange. The function of a, media, of a medium of exchange is to uh, overcome the problems of barter. Uh, and the basic problem of barter is Sometimes when two people meet and they uh, th you know, uh, see the good, each sees the good that the other person has, uh, they may, each person may desire the other person's good, but not have what that other person desires, right? And therefore, no, no mutually advantageous trade can take place. But, but a trade is sort of latently possible if one of the parties could find a third good that the other party would accept instead of his own in trade, right? And so that's, that's the, what a medium of exchange does. It performs that function of uh, secondarily, in, uh, indirectly trading, allowing a person to indirectly trade for a good and overcoming the problems of barter. <clears throat> now, this is also a present good because money fulfills this function right now. Uh, at the moment you make the trade, then the medium of exchange function is, is, is fulfilled. So it's functionally a present good, just like a consumer good is functionally a present good. <clears throat> Uh, and then, and then there are future goods. Future goods, when, when they're acted with, do not attain the end until the, a future uh, point in time. And these are producer goods. 
Right? So we act with our labor, and then the and then we realize the end an hour later or uh, five days later or whatever, uh, and so on. And then we subdivide the future goods into original factors of production, labor and land, and then produced factors of production. So these would be capital goods. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so let me uh, uh, just emphasize then that the way in which economists uh, categorize these goods, media of, media of exchange are neither consumer goods nor produce, producer goods. This is the point, right? They have a certain function, and it's neither a consumptive function nor a productive uh, function. <clears throat> However, they are goods, and that means that they, uh, they conform to all of the uh, basic general laws of goods. The laws of utility would apply, and in particular for our purposes, um, the laws of supply and demand, the determination of the price of money through supply and demand would apply because money is a good that's traded. <laughs> so there should be supply and demand, and, and, and uh, there should be a market clearing price, and it should be determined by the preferences people have to, uh, for money relative to goods, just like we talked about other goods. And then in a market economy, the production of money should also be, just like every other good, it should also be, as we say, regulated by profit and loss, just like Dr. Klein was talking about again before, uh, before lunch. Um, it, entrepreneurs would perceive that certain expansions of production would be profitable if demand for money is increasing and uh, the ramp up production. And we'll talk more about that uh, again uh, as, we go, uh, as we go on. <clears throat> but this is why we uh, single out media of exchange uh, from consumer goods and uh, producer goods. And it starts to get us at the nature of money, what, it, what its function is. <clears throat> And then second, uh, within, within the big category of media of exchange, we can subdivide the media of exchange into, um, uh, into uh, subtypes. And that's where we get to money. So money is the general medium of exchange. By general, we mean it is the most widely saleable good in the market, the most widely used media of exchange. I might also, as an aside, uh, we'll talk more about this as we go, but um, say that money also provides the unit of economic calculation, whereas, whereas other media of exchange do not. So, so that, too, is an important distinction. <clears throat> and then within the, within the uh, concept of money, uh, th these are the three, I've listed the three um, the sort of common historical forms of money. And the first is commodity money. This is where a uh, physical, tangible good uh, is used as the uh, item uh, of the general medium of exchange. Uh, silver coins is uh, the primary example in history. It's the most widely used commodity money in, in uh, all of history. <clears throat> um, obviously, the purchasing power of money, that is the price of commodity money, depends upon the price of the commodity that's used in other purposes, if, if it is indeed used in other purposes. So if silver is used commercially or uh, you know, in industry or something of the sort, then the purchasing power of money would be related to that use as well. Because if it were higher in one use and lower in another, as we talked about this morning, there, there'd be a movement, right? We'd, people would reallocate and shift toward the higher valued use. And so the purchasing power of money would you know, fall in that case if it were higher to begin with. So, there, so that has to be accounted for in thinking about uh, commodity money. Then there's credit money. Credit money is when a money substitute uh, comes into existence, which I'll talk about in just a second in definition. And then the redemption claim for the money substitute is broken. And yet, sometime later, a promise is made by the issuer of the money substitute that the redemption claim will be restored. And in the interim between the promise and the actual restoration, uh, the purchasing power of this, this uh, credit money can be affected. It, it, can, it can increase if people believe in the promise, and it could decrease if, the, if people don't believe in the promise. So it depends upon this promise. The great example in American econo economic history are the U.S. notes uh, issued by the, the uh, Lincoln administration to help fund the uh, Civil War, the sometimes called Greenback issue. And then in 1875, um, Congress put, uh, passed the uh, Re uh, Resumption Act. And the Resumption Act said, four years from now, in 1879, we're going we're to uh, re restore or, or make uh, the U.S. notes redeemable for gold. And so there's a four-year period where it was just a promise. 
<laughs> they weren't redeemable. It was just a promise. But to the extent that people believe the promise, the, the, the price of the notes, the purchasing power of the notes went up relative to gold toward the date at which resumption would uh, continue. And then there's fiat money. This is the one we're most uh, familiar with, right, in our own uh, uh, time and place. And fiat money is a money substitute that comes into existence that way. And then the redemption promise is broken. Uh, uh, so so no, no redemption. It's first a redemption. Then no redemption, and there's no promise to restore. <laughs> and so obviously fiat money's purchasing power depends neither on, a, on the promise of restoration uh, of redemption nor on the commodity value, you know, some commodity value. What it depends upon, of course, are the legal privileges that the state gives to fiat money or to the issuer of fiat money uh, that, that cause it, in fact, to come into existence uh, uh, initially as a money substitute, right? They're maintained in existence as, as, a, as a type of money. Uh, the best example we have uh, recently of this, of course, is the euro. So the euro came into existence in precisely this way. It was first a redemption claim for the different currencies of the EMU countries. And then, there, and then, you know, in, in different time frames uh, after that, the redemption claims were broken one by one in various countries. And, and uh, yet the, uh, the legal privileges for the euro and the legal disabilities against competing money were in place by the state. And uh, then we have fiat money. Right? So these are the categories. And then we get to money substitutes. Money substitutes are <clears throat> claims for uh, money that can be redeemed on demand at par. And there are, two, uh, there are two types here also. There are money certificates. A money certificate is a money substitute for which there's a 100% reserve of money. Uh, the famous example in history are the Amsterdam banks of the 1600s. Uh, the banknotes that they issued um, for over 100 years were 100% uh, were reserve. We'll, we'll talk more in this uh, toward the end about how can you run a business <laughs> if, you, if you have 100% reserve banking. OK, well, so we'll talk about that. But at this point, we just want to categorize, right? Obviously, you could do it because they're the Amsterdam banks of the 1600s who did it. So. And then the other category is uh, what Mises like to call fiduciary media. And fiduciary media are where uh, we have money substitutes, but the reserve of money against which the money substitute can be redeemed is fractional. There's only a fraction of uh, actual money uh, for redemption. And of course, this is uh, what all our checking accounts are today. Uh, by the way, even, even in the case of, uh, even in our situation like we have it today where there are excess reserves in the banks, these excess reserves are almost exclusively in the form of checking accounts that banks have at the Fed. And so if you go down to your bank and you want to cash out your checking account balance, that you, that's no good, right? That's not a redemption uh, fund uh, for, uh, for, for you, for us, the customers. This is just an accounting device that makes the banks liquid on paper. So they are still fractional reserve in the practical sense, right? Of, uh, for, for the customers, they're still fractional reserve. Uh, okay, so, so obviously then the, the big distinction, the reason we make this distinction between the two economically is because if we have money certificates, the issue of the money certificate will not change the money stock. The bank will simply issue the money certificate and they'll hold gold as reserve. And if they're holding the gold as reserve, it's not being used as a medium of exchange, it's being used as a reserve. Uh, on the other hand, the issue of fiduciary media, if it's just fractional reserve, then a bank can just issue uh, checking account balances without holding a reserve, but then they can affect the total money stock. Right? They can increase it or it could be decreased. And so obviously the implication of this is that part of the volatility of the purchasing power of money comes from fractional reserve banking. It's more volatile uh, on, on this point uh, anyway. And then finally, there are auxiliary media of exchange. And auxiliary media of exchange are uh, uh, media of exchange you know, are used uh, to facilitate the exchange by overcoming the problems of barter. But they're not used generally. So they're just used, let's say, locally in a town, or they're used just among this community of people, like cryptocurrencies, right? Maybe used as a medium of exchange, just among a, a certain group of people, um, or uh, the, the uh, town scripts that are used in Vermont towns in Bernie Sanders territory, they, uh, they have these local scripts, and you know, well, but they're just used in the town, right? These are auxiliary media of exchange, and for most purposes, they're they're not that important for us to analyze, because they're not money, and they're not and they're not a, a money substitute. They're not really part of the total money stock that we're interested uh, first and foremost in examining. 
Okay, now let's talk about the, the origin and development of money. And here the basic, uh, the basic point uh, that we want to emphasize is that, uh, here on the top of the slide, is that the origin and development of money conform to the logic of action. In other words, we could give a completely um, um, uh, plausible, justifiable, valid, um, logical argument about the origin and development of money. <clears throat> and it goes, it goes like this. Suppose we have traders uh, initially in a barter uh, arrangement. There's no money. Uh, by the way, in, in real history, there, there, there was, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. There was no money. Money's not a thing that, you know, you extract from nature. M money is in its function as a medium of exchange. So unless you have exchange, uh, there's no purpose in having money. So as the human race begins, you know, there's, there's no money. And so trade must have initially been barter. But as we've seen, if people are trading in barter, uh, undoubtedly some of them will come up with the problem of barter. They'll, they'll be stymied in their trade, uh, even, though, uh, even though each one of them is desirous of the other person's good. The, the other person's uh, not, right? And so you, you've got this uh, impasse. <clears throat> so traders then, so sometime in history, traders recognized this. They, they engaged in an in a entrepreneurial innovation to make an indirect trade. And that now we have a medium of exchange. Now, once there's a medium of exchange, then just like in any uh, entrepreneurial innovation, there can be imitation or, or a, you know, a new person discovering this innovation. And they may be using all sorts of different things as a medium of exchange. However, the next step in logic is that certain commodities actually perform the function of a medium of exchange better, objectively better than others. If they're more durable, if they're easily divisible, if they're portable, if they have useful uh, weight, uh, value to weight ratios, and so on, then, then they're just superior in their performance as a medium of exchange to other things that aren't. And so, for example, cattle was once used as a medium of exchange. It's not very good, right? Cattle can die, they can get sick, they're hard to, you know, they're, they're uh, obstinate and hard to drive places, and so on. It'd be better to co carry a gold coin in your pocket. But people could see this, right? They can, they can engage in trade, and they can see that certain things are more suited. And so they'll, they'll begin to gravitate toward just those few things that are, are better objectively at performing the medium of exchange function. And once they get to that point, if you just have a few things that are being used, gold, silver, uh, uh, copper, and so on, then the logic is that you still have trade. Uh, traders still sometimes have to trade monies in order to make their trades. And they can cut that step out just by agreement. There's no reason whatsoever to engage in that. It, it, they can just agree to, to trade in the same money and, and not different monies. And then they eliminate that step, and then they're in a better position with respect to their uh, making trades, with respect to economic calculation, because now they can calculate everything in one money instead of you know, calculating in dollars and euros and yen and, right? and so on. So, so you can see how the logic of this would play out uh, uh, in, in, a, in a kind of straightforward way. Now, I, I mentioned already that it, it, um, th there isn't, uh, we, we can never settle this question by historical uh, research. We, we, we just, <laughs> we can never penetrate, right, through the myths of history to find out, you, you know, the stories of the origin of different monies. Uh, it's just, uh, we could always, we could, it, there could always be a lost case, right? It would have been the first case that, <laughs> that followed just this logic of action and not you know, some other kind of claim about this. <clears throat> However, uh, um, I will point out that um, it, it is the case just in a logical sense that while this, uh, while this uh, explanation is logically consistent, it is not a logically uh, consistent or uh, complete uh, explanation to argue that money occurred by decree of someone or by convention. And the reason for this is, as we've already sort of noted, the reason for this is that the only way in which something can be first used as a medium of exchange, if it's already a traded commodity, because it has to be something you can trade again, right? That's the whole point. You have to pick something that's already being traded first. The origin must come that way and in no other way. You can't just decree something. Of course, you could decree that something being traded is the money. That, <laughs> but you see, the decreeing then doesn't add anything to the argument, right? That, that, that's just kind of an incidental historical fact. It doesn't add anything to the logic. 
if you don't have, if you're if you're decreeing that um, I don't know space dust is uh, is uh, money. Well, well, you know, it's not. It's never going to be money. You can't make it by decree or by. Or if we have a, you know, if all the lefties take over and they have a vote and and they and they vote space dust as money or something, right? No, 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 that uh, that won't work. So, so this is the point. And then, if this is the case, then it seems it seems highly likely that all of these steps that we talked about were undertaken by uh, private entrepreneurs and not government officials. We don't think as a kind of general rule that government officials are more astute uh, in, in, you know, doing, in, you know, um, um, innovating and doing things that are valuable to people uh, than uh, entrepreneurs, right? We, we just don't, that, that's not very plausible to assume. And we can also see then uh, the, the same thing, the same kind of logic applied to the development of money. <clears throat> so money would develop along certain lines, like, a, you know, we get modern coins that I mentioned already, silver coins. Well, actually, the silver coins are fairly ancient, but uh, we get, uh, you know, modern kinds of uh, innovations. These are all just financial innovations. And do we think, again, that government officials are making these innovations or entrepreneurs? Yeah, we're not denying that government uh, officials could impose certain changes on people, but would they be the, like, socially beneficial, thing, the most beneficial? And we would think not, right? Of course, they can impose fiat paper money on us, right? But it's, so that's not the issue. The issue is, uh, you know, it's sort of the logic of these developments within the context of the market efficiency that, that we talked about this morning. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now let me, uh, uh, let, let me move on to this uh, question of economic cap money and economic calculation and make some brief remarks about this. Dr. Klein mentioned this in his uh, talk that uh, economic calculation, while we usually think of it in the narrow context of um, entrepreneurs, it's actually a much broader concept. It, we, can, we can apply it much more broadly to our analysis than just that. And to do so, we might define uh, economic calculation the way I have on the slide here. It's using money prices in decisions about participating in the social economy. So we mentioned this this morning. Every one of us has a personal economy. We, we, we're all acting with the things that we own under our control. And we're, of course, we're interacting with other people because we want to integrate our personal economy into the social economy. We want to integrate, right, and have a social um, nexus because we, know, we, because we can see right away that it's more beneficial for us to enter this nexus uh, than to stay out of it for all sorts of reasons, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so anytime we do that, though, we need to use economic calculation. If we want to efficiently integrate into uh, um, the division of labor with our activity, if we want to buy goods that other people have produced, we need to know their prices. Uh, otherwise, we can't do this efficiently. Um, and that's what money, uh, that's what economic calculation via money provides. Since money uh, is used uh, in exchange of all the goods that are tradable in the market. All tradable goods have prices. And so every time we participate in the market, every time we buy something, like you go, you buy a new pair of shoes for $200, you know just through your own experience in buying things in, in this world what $200 will buy in terms of other goods because you know the prices of other goods. But if you didn't know the prices of other goods, you couldn't calculate that, and you couldn't know whether it was better to spend the $200 on the shoes or on something else, right? You, couldn't, you wouldn't be able to integrate efficiently. <clears throat> so economic calculation is what we use as consumers to integrate um, our consumption uh, uh, activity through trade as opposed to self-sufficient consumption. Uh, we do this also as producers. Uh, so we all own our labor services, we take jobs, well, well, how do we know? How do we know wh which job offer to take? We'll get different uh, compensation packages, and they'll have different benefits, and uh, they'll be in different places with a different structure of prices, for, you know, for apartments and food. And we, of course, we couldn't we couldn't efficiently then integrate our uh, production into the division of labor without knowing the prices of things. We have to know the prices of things in Cincinnati before we take a job there. Otherwise, we don't know what our real our actual wealth is that we're accumulating by taking a job there for $100,000, let's say, income, as opposed to a job in, um, in Dodge City, Kansas, for $100,000 or $50,000 or whatever it is, right? So we're, so we're constantly doing this. This is a, a crucial for all of us in, uh, 
um, integrating ourselves into the division of labor. And then, of course, it's especially important for, uh, for uh, entrepreneurs, as Dr. Klein already explained, <clears throat> because entrepreneurs are concerned not just with the, with the uh, doing this kind of calculation that we're talking about. They're interested in the monetary result of their business. They're interested in the monetary uh, profit or loss uh, that can be uh, accruing to them as income in their business where that's not a consideration when we're just buying things or, or even selling our uh, uh, labor services. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go on to the, to the uh, main task. This is the, uh, the price of money. And uh, the argument is, again, that the price of money uh, can be explained in the same way the price of any good can. There's some nuances and differences, but the, uh, the basic structure of explanation is exactly the same. So as we talked about this morning again, there would just be a people with reverse preferences with respect to, to a good, right? And then they, they engage in exchange. And uh, when they engage in exchange, then a market clearing price emerges for the good. But you'll notice that we, we could just do this whole analysis in reverse. We could, we could talk about one person, uh, uh, the person who's selling the good is demanding the money. The person who is uh, demanding the good is supplying the money, right? So you can see that in, in some analytical sense, these are just uh, two sides to the same coin. When we think about the purchasing power of money, what, what set of goods will a given amount of money buy? Uh, what's it, what what, what uh, purchasing power is commanded by a, a given amount of money? That's the price of money, right? The exchange value of money. Uh, and the price of goods, which is denominated in money. So, 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 right, really, so, so really, uh, at the very beginning, we shouldn't be too troubled by this. However, just to, just to make it a little bit clearer, the pedagogy that's uh, typically used, and I think it's wisely uh, applied, is uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here on this slide. Instead of talking about supply and demand, because that gets a little, <laughs> a little hard to follow sometimes with all the uh, uh, reverses that can occur, we talk instead about the total stock of a good and the total demand to own it instead of just the demand to acquire a good through exchange. So let's say, just to take a different example, let's say we wanted to, to explain the pr uh, price of houses in Auburn. We could do this through supply and demand. Right? We could say, here's the market, and here are the people selling number of houses, and here are people demanding a number of houses, and then the uh, price would adjust in order to make sure that all the traders could uh, make their trades, and we get a market clearing situation. Or we could analyze it in, the, in this way. We could say there's a total stock of housing in Grove City. We just, we just go around and we count that number of houses within the city limits. At a given moment in time, of course, that stock of housing is fixed. It could increase through production over time. It could decrease through consumption, right? Hopefully it won't be Antifa consumption, but uh, just regular maintenance consumption, right? And then, uh, uh, so that would be the total stock. And then we could superimpose on this or think about the total stock with respect to our subjective values as the uh, desire that people have to own the stock, not to trade it necessarily, but just to possess it. <clears throat> and then, of course, if we think of it this way, we could see then that there are some people who already own some of the stock, and at the given price that's uh, ruling in the market right now, they, they continue to hold on to their stock. They're not interested in selling. They're keeping it because the subjective value of keeping, this, keeping it is greater than the money they could get. We call that reservation demand for the good. And then there are other people who, who do wish to buy houses. Right? So there's some people from the outside that wish to buy houses. And there are all sorts of different reasons they might uh, have for this. They might want to live in Auburn. They might be flipping the house as an investment. Uh, they might be uh, buying the house so you, you know provide living quarters for their, for their children going to Auburn. Right, so on and so forth. All the subjective valuations that you could imagine, and they want to acquire houses, and we call that uh, the, the number of them that are doing that. We call exchange demand. That phenomenon is exchange demand. And so the price adjusts so that the total stock and the total demand are equal, just like the demand and the supply are equal. When the total demand and total stock are equal, then the supply and demand are equal. <laughs> right? You just think through the logic of it. And if the price were real high, let's say the price of houses in gross, uh, excuse me, in Auburn was uh, five million dollars, then the quantity demand would be uh, greatly reduced, right? The exchange demand would vanish, <clears throat> and uh, 
and there'd be an excess stock of houses. Just like there'd be an excess supply if we look at it that way, right? Everyone would want to sell <laughs> and no one would want to buy. And, uh, you know, you couldn't command a price of $5 million. Oh, maybe for one or two houses, but not like a you know, normal price, right? So, so, so hopefully you see that these are just uh, parallel um, analytical uh, approaches, if you uh, think of it that way. <clears throat> okay, so let's apply this to money. We can apply this directly to money. We have the total stock of money in society. This is the money proper and the money substitutes added together. Right? And so now we can apply this notion directly to our own economy right? with the fiat paper money as the currency. Federal Reserve notes, and then the money substitutes, checking account balances or checkable uh, accounts of all kinds, right? Or other redemption claims and so on. And we just add all that up. That's the total stock of money. And then the total demand for money is the, again, the, um, is the uh, desire, the amount desired by people to hold in their overall stock of goods. They want, they want to possess it, not exchange it. They want to hold it. See, so it's a different conception, right? Um, and then, again, we get this balance, right? Now, this begs the question, why do people want to hold money? We said money's the medium of exchange. We said its only function is to buy things. <laughs> why are people holding it? And, uh, the, and by the way, uh, we're not just saying this as a kind of abstraction, right? We're all holding money. All of us are actually holding money. All the money that does exist in the economy is actually being held by people right now. <laughs> you know, we have cash on our person. We've got uh, checking account balances that are positive and so on. And so why are we doing this? Well, uh, the, the basic answer to this is that possessing money allows us, better than in, possessing any other good, allows us to deal with the uncertainty of the future. It allows us to adapt to contingent circumstances that we didn't predict. And so th th this is the basic reason for holding money. There may be others, but this is kind of the fundamental reason. Uh, by the way, those of you who've studied, read some Austrian economics and studied a little bit know this. This is why Ludwig von Mises uh, stresses this, uh, dealing with the uncertainty of the future, uh, because as he points out, in the ERE, in the evenly rotating economy, there would be no money holdings. No one would need to hold money. You could arrange all your, your cash inflows and outflows, uh, your payments and so on. Uh, you could time them all by cashing out investments and you know, managing your, your consumption expenditures and so on. And there wouldn't be any need to hold money at all. So this is, a, again, the, the point of uh, when, we, when we reduce the problem back down to preferences, which is what we always do in an Austrian treatment. <clears throat> uh, okay, so the purchasing power of money then must be at the, at the point that clears the market. Again, let me stress uh, one uh, nuance here. Since each of us is engaged in our own personal economy when we integrate into the social economy, there's no reason to think that any of us care about the purchasing power of money for goods that we're not buying. What we care about is the purchasing power of money for goods that we're either buying or anticipating buying. There's only a limited set of goods that we're in or each one of us is interested in. And the other things, you know, are just incidental facts of, of social life. You know, I, uh, you know uh, I don't care about machine tool prices or, you know, what, or what, what it might be, right? Uh, land prices in uh, the tundra of Alaska. You know, it just doesn't, I'm not interested in that. It doesn't, I, well, I may be interested in the intellectual sense, but I don't, I don't care about it for my action, right? I only care about the prices that I'm, of goods that I'm engaged with. And so the purchasing power of money is, is personal. There's not one purchasing power of money. There's a, there's a whole array as, uh, for, uh, as many as there are persons of the purchasing power of money. That's an unusual thing about money, right? Uh, okay, so this is how we would uh, we uh, diagram this. You're interested in thinking about that, and again, you can see in the diagram. The diagram's helpful uh, uh, as an expository device, just to see that if the purchasing power of money were higher, that is, if the prices were goods were lower and the purchasing power was higher, then the demand, the quantity demand to hold money would be reduced, right? Because I'm holding a certain amount of money to command a certain purchasing power to deal with uncertainty. But if prices or things uh, are uh, lower, I don't need to hold as much money. So the quantity of demand would be reduced. But the total stock of money is always what it is, which means I'm not just uh, you know, burning my money, right? If, if I think I have too much of it, I'm holding too much of it. I just take it and spend it on goods. I invest it or whatever. And then this pushes the prices of goods up, which pushes the purchasing power of money down. 
right? So that's, that's the dynamic that's going on here. <clears throat> and then a similar thing if purchasing power of money is too low. <clears throat> uh, okay. Now, let me get to, uh, I want to mention this because this is a very famous theory and uh, you probably heard, um, heard about it if you studied again some monetary theory of the Austrian view. And this is Mises' famous regression theorem. So once this uh, theory had been out, uh, you know, laid out and explained, there was an objection that was raised in the literature to it. And the objection was called the Austrian circle. And hopefully you can figure out what that means right away. Uh, in other words, uh, the Austrians were accused of the logical fallacy of the vicious circle of begging the question. You're just assuming in your premise uh, the conclusion. Now, why is this so? And it's so because of the stress that Mises placed on the nature of the, of the uh, uh, money uh, as a general medium of exchange. The only function of money, is, uh, or the, I should say the primary, the root function of money is as a medium of exchange. So as he puts it in uh, Theory of Money and Credit, the objective use value of money is the purchasing power of money. The objective use value of money is just what goods can I buy with it? What set of goods can I buy with this money? Well, if that's the case, then again, uh, this seems to be reasoning in a circle, right? You're just assuming the purchasing power of money in order to subjectively value how much of it to hold. And then you're saying uh, that determines demand, total demand, and then that determines the purchasing power of money. <clears throat> By the way, the objective use value of any other good does not depend upon its price, right? You, you see, you see the, the distinction here. I don't need to know the price of, uh, you know, the, the wrap that we ate at lunch in order to uh, assess its objective use value. It has nutrition and taste and so on and so forth. But the only objective use value money has is in purchasing things. It's purchasing power. So this is a problem. And so Mises, uh, Mises' solution to this was to point out that, no, 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 th uh, this objection requires one to think about this problem as timeless. And the, and the actual situation is not timeless. In fact, uh, all we need to know uh, about the purchasing power of money, the objective use value of money, is what it has been in the recent past. Then today, we can, we can subjectively value it, right? I just need to know what it has been. Then today, I can subjectively value it. And then I can have uh, de demand for it. And then the purchasing power of money emerges, right? So that's the solution to uh, the vicious circle. Uh, but another objection then was made to this, right? And the objection is, now you've just traded one logical fallacy for another. You've traded the vicious circle for infinite regress, which is also a logical fallacy, right? You can't regress the, uh, the cause and effect structure back infinitely. Then you haven't explained anything fundamentally. You have to have a stopping point, right? And that's where Mises then comes up with the regression theorem. This is the proper, he's saying. The starting point uh, for this explanation is the objective use value of gold or whatever it was, silver, whatever it was, on the last day of barter. Then that, that market price of gold depended just upon its commodity use, right? And then that was enough, though, for somebody to use it as a medium of exchange, to value it in exchange and not just in use. And then it can just go forward, right? To, to the logic can just work forward from there. So there's a very famous uh, uh, solution to this problem uh, that I just wanted to quickly rehearse. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, now I'm going to skip over a couple of those so we get to the end here on uh, production of money. And um, uh, this, this will be a segue into the next lecture on uh, banking, uh, since the money stock, remember, is money plus money substitutes. So let me quickly just rehearse again the general principle. We didn't really talk about this um, uh, yet. Uh, the general principle of regulation in the uh, of goods production in the market. Again, Dr. Klein spoke some about this. So let's say we have a, a situation where the demand for one good goes up, which means, of course, the demand for other goods have to go down, right? So people are shifting their demands from one thing to another. Then as the demand for the uh, one good that's going up, um, uh, hits the market, uh, the price of that good will, will rise. 
And this means the price spread between output prices and input prices will grow. It'll be net, more net income accruing to it. So entrepreneurs will try to ramp up production. And they do this by buying more inputs. So they take the additional revenue that they're earning from selling the good at a higher price and they buy more inputs. This increases factor prices. And then the factor prices, again, would uh, 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 generate profit for the production of those factors and so on and so forth. This ripples out through all the stages of production. But on the, on the downside where demand is going down, there's, uh, there's the opposite phenomena, right? Or the symmetric phenomena. Demand goes down, then it's not as profitable. Entrepreneurs shrink back. Their reduced demand for the factors of production there reduces their profit, and it all shrinks back, right? Now, this isn't to say that it's a one-for-one -one movement. Quite the contrary. The social nexus is exceedingly complex, and so there's going to be movement across all sorts of different intermediate uh, uh, places in the economy, so to speak. But this is what happens. This is efficient uh, or economizing with respect to the changing, the shifting demands in the economy. The point here is if we have commodity money, it's no different. It's absolutely no different. Commodity money production just means you have a minting company that has a little uh, factory with minting equipment. And they're, if they're vertically integrated, they're mining the gold or silver, or they're buying the gold and silver from uh, mining companies. And then they're minting the coins, and then, and then they're covering their costs, right? They're paying they're paying out their costs, and they're, and they're minting the coins. And if the sum of what they mint is, exceeds their costs, they've made profit. They've made net income. The only difference between that production process and any other is if an auto company is producing automobiles and covering their costs with revenues, they get their revenues just by selling the cars, whereas the, uh, the money-producing entrepreneur gets the money just by producing it. But he's constrained, right? He's constrained in his production by profit and loss. So the more, the more his production increases, the more his costs rise in, in, the, in the industry, right? The costs rise. So it becomes more expensive to buy a gold mine. It becomes more expensive to buy equipment. You have to hire more workers, and you have to bid up wages, and so on and so forth. And then the, then the profit margins get squeezed. And then they quit expanding. Right? This is the way production uh, works in any good in the market economy. It's no different with commodity money then. Uh, a similar thing then is true about uh, money certificate production. If uh, the Amsterdam banks are producing banknotes, well, there's a cost involved, right? They have to have resources, uh, uh, labor, and uh, to be a printing press somewhere to print the notes and so on and so forth. And then, and then they charge their customers a fee for printing the note. And then the fees cover the costs. And uh, if demand for the, for the banknotes goes up because they're more convenient and whatever, and more customers want them, demand goes up, then the price will rise, and the revenue will increase. And then the Amsterdam banks will try to ramp up production to get this profit, right? They want to earn it. And then uh, you know, if it's industry-wide, then the, uh, they'll bid up the prices of inputs. And as, as this process goes on, then the, then the uh, profit margin is, is uh, reduced again so that no more expansion is profitable, and it stops. And, and all the while, the resources are coming out of other places where the relative demand is lower, as we, as we already mentioned. So this is what we mean when we talk about um, economizing money production. And then let me, uh, let me uh, mention uh, at the end here uh, on banking uh, this point about uh, credit, the credit supply being economized. What banks do, and since they're 100% reserve, of course, they just charge fees for checking accounts or banknotes, whatever the money substitute is. But they still intermediate credit. In other words, they're middlemen in the credit markets. They borrow money from savers, and then they pool it, and they uh, investigate uh, creditworthy uh, investable projects, and they lend the money to investors. And just like any middleman, just like Walmart, uh, they buy wholesale and sell retail. And the reason why they can get this price spread is because they're performing a, a, a function, a useful function that can't be performed by the, by the wholesalers, right? So you and I as savers don't want to perform the function of winnowing out who, the, who to uh, invest with, right? We want to leave that to a specialist in the division of labor. Well, but if they're going to do that, they're going to be paid, right? Because it's valuable for us to uh, ma uh, have this done for us. And so that's where the interest rate spread comes from. So now, again, let's suppose market conditions change. Let's suppose people want to save more. Well, if they want to save more, then the wholesale interest rate will be pushed down. You increase the supply of anything, and its price will be lower, right? The wholesale uh, interest rate, the interest rate at which the banks can borrow will be pushed down. 
<clears throat> then in, a bigger interest rate spread will exist. So because uh, there more, there's a more, uh, greater pool of saving, the banks can, can borrow more, even at lower interest rates, and they'll turn right around and begin to lend that. But as they increase the, the, the supply of retail credit, <laughs> the retail interest rate will fall. And then they'll stop doing this when the interest rate spread normalizes again. So all they're doing, in other words, is performing the function of, of um, allocating the, the uh, saving that we're engaged in. And again, we'll talk more about why that's economizing uh, tomorrow. But the saving that we're voluntarily supplying to them. Uh, I'll end on this note. Uh, we don't have time to cover this, but I think uh, uh, Dr. Newman will uh, mention this, at least in the next uh, talk. Um, in the in, this is the, uh, what Mises calls the unhampered market economy. If we have a hampered market economy with fiat paper money and fiduciary media, then hopefully you can see right away that the production of those two things cannot be regulated by profit and loss. You cannot regulate the production of fiat paper money by saying, let's produce all the fiat paper money that's profitable. Because you can start producing $100 bills, then when, when you produce so much money that the price of producing a $100 bill goes above $100, you produce $1,000 bills, then $10,000 bills, then a million dollar bills, and then Zimbabwe, right? right? You just, if you take that as the rule, you'll destroy the money. This, a similar thing happens with fiduciary media. Because if a, it, the cost involved for a, for a bank to issue fiduciary media is the cost of putting uh, accounting entries into people's checking accounts. They're just creating checking account balances for people, and they're extending loans to do this to them. Well, that doesn't cost hardly anything. And yet they're going to get interest on the loan, right? And they'll get some loan payments and some interest on the loan, so that's profitable. But if a bank made every possible loan that it could make to everyone you know, who would pay a couple of interest payments, they'll, they'll destroy the bank, right, in insolvency. And so they can't, they can't adopt the rule of the market Let's produce everything that's profitable and let's avoid producing where there are losses. Um, that, would be, that would be destruction in this system. And so we have to have, uh, as an alternative, we have to have monetary policy. All right, thank you for your kind attention.